open your Bibles. Title of the message this morning, A Panorama of God's Victory. A Panorama of God's Victory. We are in Revelation 11, and, and we are in a in a, we're in a critical moment, and I've, I've been kind of preparing you for it the last few weeks, but this is it, man. We are on the verge. So we're in Revelation 11 from verses 15 to 19. That's a short set of verses. That's why, um, you know, the Revelation series gets a little long, uh, because I don't want to miss any of the good stuff. So we have a small section of scripture, but a huge subject. It's a massive subject, the panorama of God's victory. Here's the question. There's only one question. And ultimately, can you hear me please? Ultimately, there's only one question. There's only one question. The question is, where will you be personally in the panorama of God's victory? Because listen, the the fact that there is a victory clearly implies that there's a defeat. There has to be a defeat to be a victory. And in the end, each one of us will be on one side or the other of God's guaranteed eternal victory. That's really what it will be about uh, the second you take your last breath here. So last week, we talked about God's faithfulness uh, to fully accomplish all of his covenant promises he made to Israel because we're going into the second half of the tribulation. It's really it's so much about Israel because as we see it, we're in heaven already. Uh, and so God is dealing primarily with Israel in the second half. And so we watched the two witnesses last week preach the truth uh, in Jerusalem about the coming kingdom of God right up until God allowed uh, the devil to kill him <laughs> uh, and then let him lay in the street um, for three days. And, and the world hated these two witnesses. Um, and so they were celebrating. And the world thought that the enemy was winning. Have you ever thought that? Have you ever looked at the world and thought, man, it kind of looks like the enemy's winning. All right, he's not. And these witnesses proved it after three days, God raised them from the dead. They stared down the cameras that had been watching them lie there. And then in true victory, he raptures them to heaven. And then just to make sure the the world understands, he gives gives Jerusalem a flicky cheek, right? He he snaps Jerusalem and and a huge earthquake comes and a tenth of the city uh, is destroyed. And And then I'm just catching you up. Last week in verse 13, the survivors of that earthquake were terrified. And it says, verse 13 says, they were terrified and they gave glory to God. Now listen very carefully. It's not because they were saved. That's not why, that's not how they gave glory to God. They gave glory to God because they had to acknowledge that that they were on the receiving end of God's true power and of God's true victory. That's what gave glory to God because they acknowledged God's power and his victory. And so we are coming quickly to the point in Revelation where the entire world will ultimately acknowledge that this is God's true power coming from heaven and God's true victory that's being accomplished on the earth. We are headed into that. And so this little section announces the final victory of God over this world and really for eternity. And so God had John focused on Jerusalem and the temple. He turns his focus now back into heaven where he sees a panorama of God's victory. That's what we wanna see today. You ready? Okay, let's pray. Lord Jesus, your word is alive. Lord, may it... (laughs) May it start a fire in us, Lord, a consuming fire. May you light your word alive by the power of your Holy Spirit, Lord, and may it impact us, God. May it leave a mark on us today for good. We pray in your name, Jesus, amen. 
So here are the big events we're headed into. This is it. Like all the lead up stuff is done as soon as we're done with this message. We're headed into all the famous like stuff about Revelation, the stuff that supermarket tabloids are written about. Uh, the woman and the dragon is coming up and then the child and then the war in heaven and then the antichrist and the false prophet and the mark of the beast, we love that one, and then the harlot and Babylon and then the war of Armageddon. Uh, and then finally, in chapter 19, the return, the second coming of Jesus Christ, when he returns at that battle of Armageddon with us with him. So Revelation's been big so far. This is our 23rd message. It's been big so far. It's about to get really big. It's about to get super, super big. And so my prayer today, honestly, my prayer is that we would stay focused on something bigger than, than the... Um, you know, the interest, the, you know, the intrigue, the speculation of revelation, we need to stay focused on the bigger picture. The bigger picture is this, where will I be when this goes down? Because it is going down and each of us will be somewhere. The question is, where will I be when this panorama of God's victory is complete? So all the intriguing stuff, all the speculation, all the stuff that sells books about who are these players in Revelation, who could they be, and what is this symbolism, and what could this symbolism mean, uh, it's nowhere near as important. It doesn't scratch the surface of being as important as you knowing where you're going to be when it happens. It's happening. For you personally, we have to answer the question. We have to ask the question, and then we have to choose carefully so that we know where we'll be when it happens. So Revelation is not, this might surprise you, Revelation is not about symbolism and speculation. It's really not. It is the singular revelation of Jesus Christ. It's who Jesus Christ is, and Revelation is about where you and I will end up when, when he wraps it up. Right? All right, so it's very personal. So like I said, we, uh, today our verses announce the completion, hear that, they announce the completion of God's victory right at the center of the book. At the end of chapter 11, there's 22 chapters, right here at the end of chapter 11, God's complete victory is announced and a very clear line is drawn in the sand, man. This is, this. the reason we're focusing on these few verses is because the line in the sand is drawn here and every single one of us will choose what side of that victory line we want to be on. The Holy Spirit is calling you. <laughs> or it's your mother. Either way, either way, whether it's the Holy Spirit or your mother, you should answer. If it's your friend saying, why in the world are you in church? Then defriend them. Uh, Revelation, <laughs> no, no, just kidding. <laughs> no, I'm not. Revelation 11, verse 15. Here we go. Then the seventh angel blew his trumpet. I've been talking about that so much, about the seventh angel blowing the trumpet and the seven bold judgments opening when he does. This is it. Then the seventh angel blew his trumpet and there were loud voices shouting in heaven, the world has now become. Do you see it? It doesn't say will, it says has. Has now become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ and he will reign forever and ever. So the blowing of the seventh trumpet opens up the final judgments, the seven bowl or seven vile judgments, and heaven knows that this will bring the final victory of Jesus Christ. Heaven knows that the victory of Jesus Christ is in these events. And so there, heaven is announcing it because it's finished. To tell us that it's already finished. So heaven is rejoicing because they know this final stage of the tribulation is opened and it's going to end with God's victory. 
So in the last message, like I was saying, we saw the world rejoice as enemies of God, which you might be able to see if you look around a little, kind of moving in that direction. <laughs> I had to force myself to not continue that thought. Um, the world was rejoicing as enemies of God when the, great, when the witnesses were killed, right up till they were raised from the dead. <laughs> but now heaven rejoices. So the world was rejoicing last message, Heaven rejoices this message. Watch for that line in the sand. It becomes more and more clear all the time, doesn't it? I mean, even with the, the, the state-run, censored uh, media that, that you know, some of us still think is real news, um, even with that, just, just, first of all, stop watching it. But if you, are, if, you are, if you are watching it, even with their desire to control you, um, you can see the line in the sand being drawn, can't you? Look around, man. Look around. And you can see the kingdom of the world versus the kingdom of God. Can you see that in our country? Man, I, listen, I'm old, but I'm not that old. I remember clearly, I remember with ever, I mean, I mean, I remember like it was yesterday when this was a Christian country where we honored God, we honored the flag, we honored our military, we honored our veterans. Mostly we honored God for this, for this, you know, for me here, for my job here. This, there was a time when this country honored God. Kids prayed in school. By the way, Webster, who started the public school system, um, made sure that the very first book in public school was, guess what? The Bible. <laughs> your kid won't even carry a Bible to school. If, you're, if your child carries a Bible to school today, you tell me, I'm gonna give him a plaque, a trophy or something, because it takes some serious courage to carry a Bible into schools today. Woo! Anyway, we gotta pick a side, man. Isn't it getting clearer that we have to pick a side? Are we going to be part of the world that is turning more and more against God, or are we gonna choose God's side? Again, Revelation eleven fifteen says, the world has now become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever. So the believers in heaven that we see as represented by the 24 elders, and if that, if that doesn't make sense to you as we talk right now, go back and get the messages from chapter four and, and you'll see the connection that we make there. And so every time we see the 24 elders in heaven, we see them as representing the church that was raptured in chapter four of Revelation, we see them in verse 16. Revelation 11, verse 16 says, the 24 elders, that's, that's us, that's the believing church, sitting on their thrones before God, fell with their faces to the ground and worshiped him. So, so far, here's what we got. The voices in heaven say that, that the victory is done. The world has become the kingdom of our Lord and he'll reign forever and ever. And the 24 elders, which represent us, the church, they fall on their faces and worship him. So catch this. This is so important. This is a side note, but it might, we, you know what? You, it was uh, so awesome to hear you guys worshiping today. Could you hear him, Sandy? It was amazing, right? Man, man. All right, so let's see how you're doing. Let's test, let's test your, your worshiper level right here. In Revelation chapter four, when we first met the 24 elders, guess what they were doing? They were worshiping. That's chapter four. In Revelation chapter five, when Jesus uh, started breaking the seals off the scroll and the judgments began, what does it say the 24 elders were doing? They were worshiping. In Revelation chapter seven, when the saved multitude of the tribulation, the martyrs that were saved out of the tribulation were brought to heaven, what does Revelation chapter seven say the 24 elders were doing? They were worshiping. 
Now in Revelation 11, verse 16, as we look at the panorama of God's victory, the 24 elders representing the church are worshiping. (laughs) So, (laughs) let's just, you know, let's just work through it. And math is pretty easy. Um, If the 24 elders who represent us are worshiping every time we see them up until this point, they do, you know, things will change as we get to 19 and and 20 of, of Revelation. But so far, what's the role of the church during the tribulation? It's worship. Every time we see the 24 elders who represent us, they are worshiping. So so doesn't it make sense that that should be our primary role right now? I mean, doesn't it? It does make sense because as soon as a rapture comes, and if you're watching the news about Israel, you know it's any minute. I'm not setting a date or all, but (laughs) I don't have any dinner plans, okay? (laughs) Just in case it's today. Listen, listen, let me tell you something. I meant to put this on the screen because, again, some of y'all are just becoming part of the family, and we love that. We love having you here in the living room. Um, Let me tell you what our, you know, every church has to have a purpose statement, a mission statement, right? Like, that's a thing the books say you're supposed to do, and so 10 years ago, after going 10 years without one, because anything those books tell me to do, I just don't, I do the opposite. Because those numbskulls are just trying to sell books. Uh, I just follow in Jesus, you know. Anyway, but we did, we, we, made us, we, made a, we made a purpose statement 10 or 12 years ago, here it is, worship. Worship Jesus Christ, that's our number one purpose statement. Our number two purpose statement is proclaim his name, tell people about Jesus. Our number three statement or part of that purpose statement is disciple his followers. That's it, that's our only role, that's the only reason we exist, to worship Jesus, to proclaim his name and disciple those who will follow him. That's it, that's all. And so listen, here's the deal, when we get to heaven, We won't have to proclaim the name of Jesus. He's there. We won't have to disciple his followers because we will know as we are known. The only thing in our purpose statement that we'll have left to do when we get to heaven is worship. (laughs) Woo! Right? Until, you know, until we, until, until there's, there's other stuff when uh, the millennium starts and and, uh, eternity starts and, 21, but we'll get to that later. But up to this point, we're worshiping, so let's, let's take a clue. Let's take a, take a little direction from what we'll be doing in heaven and, and worship with abandon, with everything we've got. In every way, that doesn't just mean sing, by the way. Worship comes from the old English word, worthship. You're showing God how much he's worth in your life. It's worth ship. So anyway, side note, back to our main point. We're looking at a panorama of God's victory as we continue. This is really the the core of it. In verses 17 and 18, we see four proclamations that all announce the ultimate victory of God over over this earth and, and for eternity. And so as these proclamations are spoken by the church, by the 24 elders, as they're spoken by the 24 elders, this line in the sand gets clearer and clearer and clearer. You guys know what I mean when I say line in the sand, right? Like back in the day, you know, on the playground, man, you cross that line, I'm gonna, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd be like, get out of here, you're an idiot, and walk away. <laughs> I still do that. Um, old habits die hard. <laughs> I'm trying to think if I've ever gotten a fight in school. I don't think so, because I'm just like, man, guys are stupid. I think it's so cool that these proclamations come from the 24 elders. 
I think it's so awesome. Here they are, starting in verse 17, proclaiming the panorama of God's victory. Revelation 11, verse 17, and they, that's the 24 elders, said, that's us talking, that's us making this proclamation in heaven. We give thanks to you, Lord God, the Almighty, the one who is and who always was, For now you have assumed, see that? For now, right now, you have assumed your great power and have begun to reign. Now, don't get this confused with the word, uh, you know, the word faith movement, like speak it into existence. That's not what's happening here. What they're saying, what we are saying, what 24 elders are saying is this is done. This is done. This is all over but the shouting. There's just, just a few things wrapping up here as the seventh trumpet blows and the final seven judgments come. And so they say, now you have assumed your great power. You have begun to reign. Heaven knows this is it. Uh, heaven, knows, heaven knows this is it. This is it. Jesus Christ has assumed his position of ruler and his reign over this earth and eternity. So there's a few more events that have to transpire, and, and honestly, they get pretty rough, and, and there's a lot of speculation, a lot of like ear-tickling stuff, but this is more important because we know right now this is a done deal, that the, that the victory of Jesus is set. So the trumpet's blown, it brings the final seven judgments, and it is finished. It's done. Jesus Christ has assumed his power, verse 17 says. He's begun his reign. And the panorama, it means means the entire view of God's victory has begun because because it's it's just not about this earth. This earth will dissolve like fire. In Revelation 21, there's a new heaven and a new earth that begins eternity. So we'll get to hang around here for a thousand years and, you know, a Garden of Eden type environment, but we'll have glorified bodies. But anyway, that's, we'll get to that when we get to chapter 20. Moving on to verse 18, the contrast, the line in the sand gets clearer and clearer. Revelation 11, verse 18, A. The nations were filled with wrath, but now the time of your wrath has come. So it's what we call a contrast verse. The nations were filled with wrath, but now the time of your wrath has come. And that's what we saw last week. It was the nations filled with wrath. This week, it's your time. The Lord's wrath has come. Two wraths. One is the world's wrath. The other is the wrath of God. So I love John Walvoord. He's our kind of our guy. He went to heaven not, not too long ago. I don't know. Maybe it's been 10 years now. Anyways, awesome uh, in times writer. John Walford says this about this verse. The contrast is clear. The wrath of humanity is impotent, but the wrath of God is omnipotent. Amen. Bam, the tweetable tweet right there. If, there, if It's an Xable X right there. The wrath of humanity is impotent. The wrath of God is omnipotent. Man, tell me about it. That makes me really glad to be on God's side. Really, really glad. Have you have you been mad at God? Have you have you have you known someone that was mad at God? I've known a lot of people mad at God, and no matter how much wrath they have towards God, not going to change anything. But God's wrath is omnipotent. That's going to change some stuff. So. The nations that are filled with wrath are gonna be easily led by the Antichrist into the final great battle in the Jezreel Valley, the Battle of Armageddon, at which point God will once and for all clearly show the difference between man's impotent wrath and God's omnipotent wrath because the the armies of the world are gonna gather together to fight the Lord. And the Lord's gonna be like, whoosh, all right, that's done. And we're gonna be like on white horses. We're gonna be like, we rode all the way from heaven for that? That didn't take long. <laughs> oh, that's gonna be fun. 
Listen, here's the point. We choose. We get to choose. We get to choose which side of this wrath we want to be on. The impotent wrath of, of man or the omnipotent wrath of God. We choose, and we have to choose carefully. The line in the sand keeps getting clearer and clearer and clearer. Second part of verse 18, Revelation eleven eighteen 18b says, it is time to judge the dead and reward the servants. You see the contrast? Judge the dead, reward the servants. Let me see. It's a hard choice. Um, I'm gonna go with reward the servants, right? Do you, see how, do you see how clear it gets? It's time to judge the dead and reward the servants. The prophets, we start with because we're speaking. The prophets, as well as your holy people, holy means set apart for God, and all who fear your name from the least to the greatest. And I don't want to say, of course, that fear is that awe, that reverence for God, that, that, that fear of respect and honor for God. All who honor your name, all who fear your name from the least to the greatest. It's a simple and a clear line. And today, today we can choose whether we want to be judged with the dead or rewarded with the faithful. God doesn't choose that. Well, <laughs> oh. we did this Wednesday, right? I, I can't do this here today. Uh, but uh, yes, God chose you. And you must choose, choose him. Ah, how can it be both? They have to pick one side or the other. No, you don't. God chose you and you must choose him. Or he didn't choose you if you refuse to choose him. So who choose, chose first, the chicken or the egg? <laughs> All right, I should not have even touched that. Listen, I'm thinking, I was telling Wednesday night group, I, I'm thinking about <laughs> this, you're going to, you're going to hate this. Who's done? I'm thinking about teaching a whole series on this concept of, of these two guys' names, Johnny and Jacob, uh, John Calvin and Jacob Arminius. Uh, thinking about teaching a whole series on that after Revelation. It would be fun, wouldn't it? <laughs> All right. Sandy says yes. Oh, that will raise some hackles. Uh, so I guess <laughs> right down my alley. Um, listen, can I tell you something? First time I heard the gospel message, I was 19 years old. That should be a shock to you. First time I heard that God loved me enough to die for me, to pay for my sins. At that moment, I immediately chose to be on God's side. The first time I heard the gospel message, and here's, here's how it happened. Here's how God brought me to this side of rewards for the faithful. It's John 1, verse 12. It says, but to all who did receive him. Listen, I was, I was you know, I was a hippie kid living really like couch surfing in Hollywood, not really on the streets, but just sleeping with whoever's couch I could sleep on. I actually was sleeping in a recording studio at the time, but... Uh, but that morning, I received him into my life. All who believed in his name, verse 12 continues. It means, this word believe means to put your full trust and faith in. It doesn't mean that you believe that God exists. The devil believes that God exists. The demons believe that God exists. That's not this word. This word believe means to put your full trust and faith in who Jesus Christ is. To all who did that, he gave the right to become children of God. That was April 29th, 1979. And I crossed this line permanently, because God will finish the work he started. Doesn't mean I wasn't stupid after that day, I still was. But God owned me. He owned me. And I went from, from giving my allegiance to the world to giving my allegiance to Jesus Christ that day. 
and there's a day coming when God is going to judge the dead, meaning you were dead in Christ, Ephesians 2 says. Ephesians 2, I guess it's verse 1, uh, says you were dead in your trespasses and sins when God saved you. And one day God is going to judge the dead and reward the faithful. And, and, and really nothing else matters on that day when you're standing there. Only, the only thing that's going to matter is what side of that line am I on? Because listen, here's a little secret, and it's very important, and, and honestly, <clears throat> it's a big church that, <laughs> listen, I'm just going to say it straight out, purgatory doesn't exist, not in the Bible, because it's made up by a very big church. Um, here's the truth. There's no line jumping in heaven, you know, where you're like, hey, that line looks better. I'm going to jump over there. You can't. Luke 16 makes it clear, no crossing that divide. So be clear today in case it's your last day. No matter who you are, no matter where you are today, if you will truly put your faith in Jesus Christ, trusting and believing that he is who he says he is, then you will be on the right side of that line when that time comes, and believe me, you wanna be. You want to be. So if you're there, rejoice, be glad, get excited, okay? Because this life is short. If you're not there, I want to encourage you, uh, get there. It's a free gift. It's received and put your faith in him. All right, fourth proclamation. Uh, God gets to the spiritual side of things. Uh, This fourth proclamation in verse 18 deals specifically with God's victory over the spiritual enemy, or at least it seems to. Read it with me. Revelation 11, 18, C, it says, it is time to destroy all who have caused destruction on the earth. So a little play on words there. This is always fun when God does this in the Greek. This is literally, it's time to destroy the destroyers. It's time to destroy those who destroy. That is almost certainly a reference to our spiritual enemy. The devil himself, Lucifer, is called the destroyer, Apollyon. The angels that left with him, they are destroyers. And the nations of the earth have already been judged. We just handled that earlier in the verse. And and so here, it just seems like this is the final judgment for God's spiritual enemy. And so the panorama of God's victory is set both for those uh, who are dead and, and, and the spiritual destroyers. Man, you see, there's really only one question, right? God wins, like, that's done. But we still have to choose to be with him or against him. So huge exclamation point to finish up this section, Revelation 11, verse 19, super fun verse. I uh, love this verse. Revelation eleven nineteen 19 says, then in heaven, the temple of God was open. Now, let me just pause right there and say, does anybody, does that like, like anybody say like, oh, the temple of God in heaven? Huh, you mean like the Jewish temple of God in heaven? Yeah, that's the only one there is. That's the only one God created. This is the first time in Revelation the temple of God is mentioned. This is, there's only one other time in the Bible that the temple of God in heaven is mentioned, and that's in Hebrews. This is the temple of God in heaven. The temple of God was opened in heaven, and then look, the ark of his covenant could be seen inside the temple. Now listen, if you're a Jew, That right there, that blows your mind. Like, man, let these people read the New Testament. You rabbis, you silly rabbis. (laughs) Silly rabbi, New Testament is for Jews. Uh, (laughs) I'm sorry. Listen, listen, for a Jew, they'd be like, whoa, 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 wait a minute. The temple of God, that's our temple. The Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant has been lost since the end of the Exodus. There is no Ark of the Covenant. 
the Ark of the Covenant, this is huge for Israel. Remember, the second half of the tribulation, primary focus on Israel and returning Israel to God, the temple of God in heaven, the Ark of the Covenant, first time it's mentioned in the tribulation in Revelation. To the Jew, there's no greater vision than this. This temple in heaven is the reality of what the earthly temple was a picture of. From the days of the tabernacle, when the first the first article of, of worship that was built by God in Exodus or commanded to be built was the Ark of the Covenant. And from there, the tabernacle was built. And from there, the temple, the, number, the two temples were built, two plus the addition in the New Testament, uh, the add-on, the remodel. <laughs> uh, where were all the remodel shows back then when Herod remodeled the temple? <laughs> all right, that was a big remodel. Um, listen, listen, this is the real deal in heaven. This is the real deal. In the Ark of the Covenant, the holiest article of worship for Israel, it represents God's constant presence with Israel. It represents all of God's promises to Israel. The articles in the Ark represent God's promises to Israel. It is covered by the mercy seat, a solid gold seat or top on the Ark of the Covenant on which once a year, Yom Kippur, the blood of a spotless animal, they would use a ram or a lamb, the blood of the spotless lamb was sprinkled on the mercy seat for the atonement of sins for the people of God. That's Jesus Christ. The mercy seat on the Ark of the Covenant is a picture of Jesus Christ and us being washed of our sin by his blood being sacrificed on the mercy seat. It's a big deal. God's victory is real in every way. His victory is real over the evil of the world. His victory is real over the evil realms and the spiritual realm. It's real and it is finished, tetelestai. And when Jesus Christ cried out tetelestai on the cross, he made a way to finish your sin and death and your eternal death. That victory is finished because Jesus Christ made a way for you to be on the right side of this line. It's a finished, complete, guaranteed, eternal victory in Jesus Christ. Woo, that's big. Listen, guys. <laughs> God's not worried about what's happening in the world. He has a plan, and it will come to pass. And if you'll surrender your life to him, then his plan for you will come to pass as well. And ultimately, no matter what you think about this life, ultimately the part of the plan that you want to come pa to pass for your life is being on the right side of this line when God's victory is revealed to the world, to all of creation. Here's what Jesus said in John 5, 24. Jesus said, I tell you the truth, those who listen to my message and believe in God who sent me have. It's a present, it's a word of present possession. They have eternal life and they will never be condemned for their sins. But they have already passed, past tense, they have already passed from death into life. It's a finished work. Jesus Christ has already won the victory over the forces of evil, over sin and death and the grave and the evil of this world and the spiritual realm. And as sure as his victory is over the world, it can be that sure in your life. That it can be just that sure. You can't earn it. You can't deserve it. And listen, please, once you truly have it, you can't lose it because God doesn't foster his children. He permanently adopts them. And we take on his name like little Ethan James Mendoza. 
We take on our Father's name because we're His. So we've seen a panorama of God's victory. I pray that you're grateful. I pray that you're grateful. I'm grateful for God's free gift of salvation because I've never done anything to earn it or deserve it. But, but I received it. And I didn't know, I didn't know up from down. I mean, I'd, I'd probably seen a Bible somewhere, but I'd certainly never read a word. But I knew that day, I need to be on the right side of this thing. And it radically transformed my life from that day to this day. And that free gift of salvation will not only save you today and transform your life here, but it will enable you to take part in the ultimate victory of God that is already set. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, Lord, we see so unclearly, Lord. We see dimly, as in a mirror, the things of this world, the things of our flesh, our own thoughts, our silly intellect, our own opinions and ideas, they all get in the way. They dim our eyesight until we have scales covering our eyes. And we pray, Lord, that you would remove the scales. Remove the scales from our eyes and we could see your free gift of salvation and give us the faith, Lord. Give us the gift of faith to receive, to receive that free gift of salvation that we would be permanently adopted into your family and into your victory. If that's not you today, why not make it today? What do you have to lose? Hmm. The evil in this world, an eternal separation from God, the effects of the destroyer on your life. There's nothing to lose and everything to gain. And so I just ask you to pray right now and just say, Jesus, save me. Save me. Please forgive me of my sin. Come into my life, Lord. Wash me clean. Make me whole. Permanently adopt me as your son or daughter. Fill me with your spirit. I surrender my life to you today. And I thank you for saving me. In your name, Jesus, amen.